Welcome to the Smart Business Revolution. 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 Do you want a revolution? Yeah. You say you want a revolution. Revolution. The revolution. It's going on right now. Welcome to The Revolution, the Smart Business Revolution podcast, where we ask today's most successful entrepreneurs to share the tools and strategies they use to build relationships and connections to grow their revenue. Now, now, your host for The Revolution, John Corcoran. All right, welcome everyone. John Corcoran here. I'm the host of this show, and it's such a privilege every week to get to talk to smart CEOs, founders, and entrepreneurs of all kinds of different companies, ranging from Netflix to Kinko's, YPO, EO, Activation Blizzard, Lending Tree. Go check out our archives. There's lots of great episodes in there. I'm also the co-founder of Rise 25, where we help connect B2B business owners to their ideal, ideal prospects. Quick shout out to Carl Smith, Carl Smith of Bureau of Digital, who helped connect me to today's guest who also belongs to the Bureau of Digital Community, which I belong to as well. And this is part of our top agency founder series. Paul Bellows is our guest. He's a 25-year veteran of digital services industries. He was designing websites in the mid-90s, back when most people didn't even know what the internet was, or they didn't even call it that back then. It was the World Wide Web and the inter information superhighway and stuff that we never, we, you know, I think we stopped calling it around the time of Y2K or something calling that. And he is the founder and president of Yellow Pencil. It's a Canadian digital agency. It's focused on the public sector and digital service transformation. Um, that's my background in the public sector. So I'm gonna be interested to talk to him about that. And he's provided consulting and advisory services to leaders at all kinds of different levels of government in Canada and the US. He's also the host of the 311 podcast featuring innovators in digital, government, and he's also the proud co-parent of the future teen star of whatever replaces TikTok in roughly five years. I love that. <laughs> this, of course, is brought to you by Rise 25 Media, where we help B2B businesses to get clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships with Done For You podcasts and content marketing. Go check us out at rise25media.com or email us at support at rise25 media if you have any questions about that. All right, Paul, um, it's such a pleasure to have you here today. And uh, take me back to this moment in time. This is about 10 years ago now. Uh, you have got one source, one predominant source of leads for your business. At this point, you've been in business for, let's see, it's probably about 15 years, 14, 15 years. Yep, and yep. Uh, you're doing great. Things are trucking along. You know, you don't even need a sales team or marketing team because you've got this consistent source of leads. And then, oh my gosh, everything grinds to a halt because this company that you're partnered with just decides to have a pivot in direction. I think my heart is palpitating just thinking about it, but take me back to what that was like. Well, I, I still get a bit of a cold sweat when I revisit that time in my memory, but uh, there's, there's an old saying in business that um, you can solve, there, there, there's few problems in business you can't solve with revenue, you know? Um, and there's a few problems you can solve without revenue. You know? So um, when revenue stops coming in, it's, it's a really, it's a really challenging moment for any business person. And we had, you know, we had grown, so at the time, my brother and I were running the business together, uh, my brother, Dave, um, and he was a great innovator and, and, a, and a great colleague to work with. Um, and the two of us were had stumbled, you know, you stumble across relationships in business sometimes. Sometimes you're really strategic about it. Sometimes you're in the right place at the right time. You, you know, the, the say, you know, it's, it's, it's about being ready for when lightning strikes. We, we had had one of those lightning strike moments where, uh, we've been working on a, a large, we're up here in Canada, and, and I'm based in the province of Alberta in the city of Edmonton. And so sort of the seat of our provincial government is here, and, and a lot of the, the, the core communications folks are here. And we have been brought in to help them with uh, a website redesign for sort of their global platform. They're around about 400 websites, 125,000 pages of content. There's a massive ecosystem. And, and, and at the time, we were one of the companies that was really... Uh, probably skilled at doing that kind of work, that, that larger enterprise digital work. Um, we were a digital specialist. We weren't an agency that had stumbled into the web. We'd sort of been born on the web and were of the web. And so we were well positioned to do that type of work. And we've been doing a lot of work with content management systems. And, and the government of Alberta had bought this platform called Red Dot, which was in the mid, in the early 2000s, one of the hot technologies. It was a company out of Germany and they created this really innovative database-driven platform for managing content. Um, 
And we got in and the government was really struggling with it. They were having trouble with the technology. They weren't, they hadn't really done this kind of an implementation before. And we'd done several of them. Um, so they extended our design contract and said, can you help us get this technology right? And, and we did a great job. I got to give most of the kudos to my brother, Dave, who was more, I was more on the creative side. He was more on the technology side. Um, and he just managed to get in and figure it out uh, and made some great decisions for them. And they loved it. And then Red Dot, the company, loved us. They said, hey, you just rescued this client who was slightly in jeopardy and wasn't sure they were going to continue to pay their license fees. You know, they were considering it backing away. So they brought us into another engagement and then another. And, and then eventually they got acquired by a bigger Canadian company, actually, called OpenText out, out of Ottawa here in Canada. And OpenText brought us along as a partner and kept sending us deals and sending us deals. And almost 100% of our growth came from that key relationship. We made them their customers happy. They brought us new deals. Every time someone bought their platform, uh, they would recommend us as a, as a preferred partner. And you're right probably not until, thinking at all that this is a bad thing. It just oh, feels like just a great thing because, you know, so, so often in business, you struggle to find a relationship like that. And when you find one that works, why, why ever would you think it's a bad thing? They're bringing us Fortune 500 companies and, you know, like the Wharton School came to us as a client. We still have them as a client, and, you know, um, and, and so they're just bringing us these large brand name organizations that from way up here in northern Canada, we never would have found these relationships on our own. You know, we were just too far away. We were out of market. There's no reason that someone like that would come wandering up to northern Canada to find a digital partner. So, yeah, we, we were. And, and I mean. You know, they sort of say don't have too much too many eggs in any one basket with a client, but we hadn't really looked at it in terms of what happens if our software partner goes away. And it wasn't so much that open text went away, but they they acquired some new technology that was even a little more modern and a little more interesting to them. And and really within about a an 18 month period, every lead we had dried up. Just wow. every lead we had dried dried up. And you know, like our sales team was me. Someone from OpenText would call and say, we have a new opportunity. Are you interested? And I would say, yes. And we would sit down and write a proposal you know, for it. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't really work we were even pitching competitively for. We were always the preferred vendor. Um, and when all of that dries up and you suddenly realize, I need to learn how to market my company. I need to figure out who my customer is. Um, we need to relearn a brand new technology stack. Um, boy, those were, those were just the hardest couple of years and it all really mm. came to a head i can recall in 2014 and i know it was 2014 because that's the same year my daughter is born my first child was born and uh and so my partner had gone on maternity leave for the year so she was sort of on a, a very low um uh, level of income just we have great federal government programs to support uh new parents here in canada so, but you know so some income coming in I had to go off payroll because we ran out of money in the company. Like we were just uh -huh. hurting and we had, we, we had grown to 38 people and we had to downsize rapidly mm. to 26, laying off people that you care about mm. and employees you fought hard to, to recruit and train mm. and empower and, 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 and people you had, you know, trust-based relationships with sitting in a room and saying, I've got to let you go uh, mm. is, is, it's just the, the worst feeling. <laughs> like it just, mm. you just feel like a, a complete failure as a person. Um, and as a leader, you know, and as a business person, you know, in every aspect of, of who you thought you were, you know, you, you, you've convinced yourself you're good at something and then you realize I didn't even really know what I was doing. And then uh, it, it's a really quick about phase. So, yeah, th th that was a hard year, a really hard year. Um, you know, and financially, I assume you personally. couldn't you, you couldn't just evolve with this new technology and sell that new technology. We took a look at it and we weren't convinced, you know, it, it was we and and I think we were right. You know, I don't think open tech sold a lot of that platform. I think mm -hmm. I think that the last sale of that technology may have come before the acquisition. And, and I don't think they really were successful with it. So I don't think we would have seen much uplift. And, and it was it was one of those products that looks great on the outside. They had a great customer base. You know, Disney was a customer, but it just it was so complex that that mm -hmm. customers were really struggling just to get get it implemented. And we thought we were. We were unwilling to uh, to take that ride. And that's um, an even tougher decision then, because on oh, the yeah. one hand, you could have pursued that in spite of your misgivings and continued yeah. the relationship, which had brought you so much business. But it's almost like you took a principled stand and said, no, nah, we've looked at this product and we don't want to throw our lot in with this product. Well, I mean, you know, 
it's important because, you know, you're sort of that sort of sacred bond you have with a customer of, you know, we're going to commit to a working relationship. You're going to pay me for work and I'm going to deliver work of good quality. If I really don't feel like I can deliver work of good quality or at a cost that I think is reasonable in the market, um, it, it's not going to be a good relationship. And I, I just, I'm the kind of business person who likes to sleep at night and who likes to have good relationships with the customers and who likes to do what I say I'm going to do. And we just weren't convinced we could be successful in the technology. So it was really just in our own self-interest. We just thought yeah. getting into this thing where you're you're hustling to sell the wrong thing to the wrong person and constantly try and convince them that that they haven't made a bad choice and constantly running change requests to solve failures of the technology, you know, that, that just felt like a bad, yeah. a, a bad world, a world I didn't want to live in. So and so I, how I, long did it take you to, did it take the company to recover? Cause you're, you know, I, I don't know how big your team is now, but you've got a fairly large company now. So I imagine you're larger than you were then, but how long did it take you to really get your feet under yourself and, and figure out your new market and figure out how to sell and get leads and that sort of thing? Well, it, it took, I would say it took us, the better part of, well, probably two years, two to three years. Um, and I mean, one of the things that my team has heard me say way too often, I think is, you know, I've never learned anything worthwhile from success. Um, everything you learn, it comes through failure. Everything that's really worthwhile is when you get it wrong and then you get, you figure out how to get it right. So we built, we built most of the mature aspects of our company during that two years, the things that were, that were really um, drivers of our success got created during that time. The, the way we manage projects, the way we, we market and sell, the way we manage customer relationships, uh, you know, the way we train and develop our team, all those things we built during that time uh, because we had to, to survive, you know, our, our back was against the wall and, and, you know, the, there's, you know, we haven't, we haven't missed a payroll in 25 years and I wasn't about to do that. So, um, you know, we really just worked hard to do everything we could to keep the ship together. And, and how um, long did you have to go without a paycheck for? I was off for about six months. So I'm, wow. I'm really happy for Visa. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, yeah, it, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a pretty, it was, it was a pretty tight six months. I didn't sleep a lot during that time. Wow. You know, I think I was sleeping two hours a night for, for about half a year. Um, and it was just, it was just through sheer will and hustle. My, you know, a business partner, I just somehow, clawed our way back in, into, into uh, a viable position as a business. And we've been thriving since then. He, he actually left the company at the end of 2017. And he really was excited to try just a new chapter. He's doing some consulting with other digital agencies, doing, doing great work out there. Um, and since then, we, we launched in a bit of a new strategy. And it was sort of part of what we learned was, you know, we need a market focus. We need to know how to do something for a customer and add value up to a particular kind of customer. Um, we didn't really want to be sort of just in a generic area where, hey, we can do anything for anybody. You know, we really wanted to know certain things. So we doubled down on public sector and government and said, you know, we think that there's a real opportunity to help government with how they deliver services and information online, to build some real expertise, uh, to build a market focus and, and to have strong relationships in that market and a stronger brand in that market, especially given where we are up here in Canada. Um, you know, we're far away from a lot of places and just being known for doing a thing well has, has proven to be uh, one yeah. of the, the, the secrets to our, our more recent success here. Yeah, it's funny because I'm looking at you now over the Zoom here and you've got kind of a Hawaiian shirt on. You've got a bunch of guitars on one wall and you got amps on, against the other wall. Something doesn't scream government worker to me here. So it, but, what was it that, that drew you to it? Why, why did you feel so passionate about government, especially given from a business perspective? It can be challenged to it can be a challenge to get that type of work. It can be a long sales cycle and government oh, yeah. is, tends to be frugal. The sales cycle is brutal and the budgets are challenging. Um, but what I'll say, I mean, one thing, you know, you, you might say I don't look like I work in government, but you start to meet people who work in government, people who are really in government. And some of the things that are true about them is they they live their life with a purpose, you know, mo most of them. Um, they, they value their, their life as much as their work. You know, they, they want work and life balance. You know, they want to be parents and, or, or hobbyists or a musician or something. And government is the kind of job that tends to be 40 hours a week, tends to be fairly manageable, tends to have a lot of stability to it. Um, so a lot of really, really interesting, passionate, socially minded, you know, like, like intelligent people go into government work. And some of the best people I know work in government. One of the reasons I would like working for government is, 
you know, there are definitely people that get beat up by the bureaucracy and become jaded and become political. And, you know, like that definitely exists in government. But most of the average people that I work with day to day are the people that are trying to fix things, trying to work in their communities, trying to improve things for people. You know, because you got to remember, government is, you know, it's teachers, it's, 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 it's nurses, it's healthcare practitioners, it's, at least in Canada, it, it usually is. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the people who pave your roads and pick up your garbage and the people who mow the lawn in, in your, at your neighborhood park. You know, that's who government is. And that, that's who works there. It's people who want to invest in the communities and be part of something meaningful. So government work to me is really exciting because, you know, I, I get to make that promise to my team of, you know, every day you're going to come to work and you're going to make some small incremental difference in the world right around you in the people yeah. that who are your neighbors, who might be your family, uh, the people you might ride the bus with. Um, and it's, what, it's, it's, it's important work. What have some of the challenges been since you decided on that being your market? What have some of the challenges been for you with, um, with pursuing that as a market? Well, definitely, you know, we, we don't sell in the way that, that any other organization working in commercial work would sell, you know, so every, every bit of work that comes to us, every, every new, or at least every new client relationship that comes to us comes through a request for proposal, some formal public tendered opportunity where a consultant has written a massive tome of, of requirements that someone has worked out over a year and you need to respond to them and explain why you're the best and price competitively and, and have a high value proposition. And it's really, really hard to win an RFP because Sounds, you know, sounds wonderful. Yeah. It's, 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 <laughs> it's a grind, but yeah, but it's also just, it's part of what we've just accepted is, is the way that our industry works. And, and generally once you pass sort of that, that initial gate of, of, of getting through an RFP process and sort of grind, grind it out and kind of prove that you can do the work and prove that you understand the technology, you know, it, it, it is a real test of, of your competence. Once you get onto the other side, you're now in a working relationship with a group of people where Future projects, you know, usually you have a vendor of record status for some some number of years where you can provide support and enhancements and ongoing work. And that's the stuff that gets really exciting. So, you know, it, it's painful and it's a long sales cycle and it's a ship that turns slowly. Like there's not much we can do if we have a down month. There's not much we can do to light up work quickly. You know, it's mm. it's government and they, you know, they move at a bit more of a glacial pace just because they they carry a yeah. lot of water concurrently within government. There's a Apple has like five products they're selling at any given time government, even a city will have 800 services they have to maintain all concurrently. And so it's just, all the it's time, hard. Yeah. They're stretched thinner. Yeah. So yeah, we, you know, we, it, it's, it's, there's a, there's a challenge to it and, and we're probably less profitable than a lot of other agencies like ours because there, there are fewer things we can do to impact profit, you know, quickly when, when there's something outside of our, our world that, that changes, um, you know, or outside of our control that changes. But, but there's also stability. Government always pays their bills. Government is a reliable partner. Government, you know, when they commit to work, we generally see the work get finished. Um, the work is interesting. It's challenging. It, it's it's, it's, it, it's uh, something that my team is inspired to work on. Yeah. Um, Actually, I wanted to ask you about that because, you know, that's one thing that a lot of the agency leaders that I've talked to in this series have talked about, you know, some struggle with um, making sure that their work is purposeful or, or there's a tension mm -hmm. sometimes, especially if you have a client coming to you, throwing a lot of money your way, yeah. but you, you don't know if you really believe in what they're doing, you know, that sort of thing. Did you find that your team was more motivated once you drilled down on this market or did the, the team evolve where you started attracting more people that were really motivated by the work that you do and the purpose behind it? I, I mean, Without a doubt, you know, and, and, you know, you and I are talking in like September of 2021, which was supposed to be the end of the pandemic, but it isn't quite, you know, in, in either of our countries. Um, and, you know, we, we've, it's been a hard year for all of us who have been locked at home. You know, I, I have staff who have been at home with children in the house trying to do online learning while they're trying to work. I have staff who are single people in urban centers living in tiny shoebox condos and they've been trapped in those condos you know for way longer than they would have expected to be um you know i have people who have had family and friends uh, you know in, in real peril um or in in, in you know in, in in adverse health situations um and it's just also just been a time of a lot of anxiety and so you know how do you keep a group of people motivated through that time and how do you how do you keep good people on the job during that time. Well, I mean, work that's worth doing is, is been really key to, to our, our, our stability over the last year and a half. And I think the fact that we've kind of come out with, we, we lost a couple of people this summer uh, in senior positions. So I think we're just exhausted and needed a change. 
Um, but we've kept our team whole through this and, and people continue to show up at work and, and, and be energized by the work. And so I, I don't know that a paycheck, I just, I don't know, a, a paycheck at the end of the day is only worth so much. It's only really, I mean, it's worth a very specific amount, actually, and not, not more than that. Um, so the question is, you know, what, what else are people getting out of bed for? You know, what, why is this work exciting? Why is it energizing? If you could do 100 different things for that same paycheck, and in tech, there's 100 jobs that any of my people could be offered tomorrow, and they, they would be great jobs, you know? Right. But, so you but why is the work that with you're the purpose doing? that you're doing, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, and, right. and then talk about... Um, you know, I, I loved working in government when I worked in government. It, it felt very, as you said, very purposeful. Uh, one of the challenges, though, is that, I mean, I remember I was I was the White House in 1999, 2000, when the Y2K yeah. was coming through. And we yeah. had this we had these weekly meetings about this software that we were using that we were worried it was going to crash. And fortunately, it, it, it forced them to get rid of this horrible old software and put in some new software, which was a good yeah. thing. Um, but you know it's difficult to get get governments to invest long term in major wholesale change. You know you said yourself they kind of think in three year cycles. Um, how do you, as a technologist, someone who probably can see the future, is probably get excited about I don't know cryptocurrencies or excited about blockchain or things like that? How do you try and get your clients to adopt those technologies? Well. <laughs> So I think that the first thing is we never sell technology for technology's sake. Like technology is how, not why. And if you don't get to the why, I mean, I, I love Simon Sinek, you know, uh, his, his, his golden circle, you know, it's, it's why, what, and then how. And, and so strategically, you know, we start with our why, but we also start with why for our customer. And that almost always comes from user experience. You know, it, there are almost no people who work in government who haven't completely lost their way in the bureaucracy that, you know, like I said, you know, that does happen from time to time. You find those people that have become jaded, but, but most aren't. And when you start talking about citizen experience, like, Hey, this is what it's like for a citizen to, to access this service, but here's what it could be like, you know? Well, that's what people get, get out of bed for on the government side. Like, Oh, that would be way better for everybody. My constituents would be happier. My, you know, the people I'm accountable to would be happier. We would get fewer complaints. That would, it would just feel better to, to, if that was the citizen experience that we could deliver. And, and then from there, that's, that becomes the basis for every conversation of, well, what do we need to do with technology? How might we do that? What systems would be necessary? So it's what you lead with. I think that, that, that is what motivates change. So we brought in to a, to a big Canadian city, we brought in some AI technology that, that essentially lets us build what we call conversational agents, hmm. which are robots that will answer yeah. the phone and talk to people on the web. And it's some special Google technology that we work with. Um, and and boy, that, that's a hot button because you're talking about a unionized organization where mm. this could be like, is this taking a person's is it taking job jobs, away? jobs, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we, we have issues of like, like equity and like bias in this tech, you know, like, are we equally serving all people? Does this technology prefer white male voices? Mm. Yes, it does. You know, and, and yes, it does. That's, that's a problem with the technology. It's not perfect technology. Mm. How are you going to overcome that bias? How are you going to work around it? How are you going to account for it so that we're not adversely um, it, it, impacting the experience of one group of humans versus another group of humans? And sort of like leaning into sort of societal power imbalances. Government is nervous about that. So it was big, scary technology. But the reason we, that we were successful was we started from that, that experience and we said, we can really help people to get more information more quickly without straining your already strained budgets. You know, we, we can use this to automate the things that people shouldn't be doing. You know, there's certain things that people shouldn't be doing here. But we're going to make the jobs of the people who are already working for you more valuable. They're going to deliver more value. They're going to do they're going to be less stretched thin, you know, so we, we really looked at it as, as a, an experience, both for the people within the city and, and then for the, for the citizens to say, this, this is better for everyone. And our, and our client agreed that we were able to roll us into this technology to, to great success and, 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 and handle just a lot of, you know, turn a, a, a short, like a nine to five service into a 24 seven service and, and make sure that it was easier for people to find out how to deal with their garbage and get on a bus and find a rec center, you know, all these things that people needed to do where, a human didn't necessarily need to answer that call. Um, those answers were probably already on their website, but you know, they were people were moving to call centers and other things. So those are the kinds of things that when you pull it off, it's it's really exciting. But you've got to start with experience and with with the right. why, which is we want citizens to have a better experience working with government. 
Yeah. So, so bringing it back to that allows you to overcome the, the challenges and the concerns and stuff that come up or, or it makes it easier. It yeah. makes it more easy for you to do that. What are some other examples of other um, solutions you've implemented where you've, you know, focusing on improving the experience you've been able to revamp, you know, an, an experience and make it much uh, more accessible for people? One of my favorites that we did, uh, just launched this one last year. Um, it, it, was, it was about an 18 month project. And so uh, Alberta Justice, so I'm, I'm in the province of Alberta. Alberta Justice administers the court system here. It's the provincial department. And, and, and so in, in the same way that, you know, you, you have a, a state department of justice in, in, in any U.S. state, we have our department of justice here in, in Alberta. And they challenged us to say we want to digitize certain aspects of how traffic tickets are, are dealt with in, in, in the community. So, uh, you know, we have large urban centers here in Alberta. We have a lot of small rural centers and we have centers in between. And when you get a traffic ticket on a highway or a, a, a municipal road uh, in this province, it's given to you by the local the police department who then register that ticket in a provincial database. And, and at the time, you know, there was a way you could look up your ticket number and it would take you to a payment form and you could pay online. Uh, and that was fine. But if you wanted to dispute a ticket, you had to book a court date, you had to show up in court, you know, a, a, a judge or a prosecutor had to look at you, you know, that's a, that's a huge part of, of how the justice system works is a judge will make a judgment on you, they see you in person, you know, they, they put eyes on you and they they hear your story and they make a character judgment or, or, or a legal judgment or a policy judgment on should I give you a reduced ticket? And so this system, you know, we were talking about like $200 tickets and someone wants it knocked down by $80 because maybe the signage was inappropriate or they were rushing to the hospital and, and believe that that's a just cause for what, why they were speeding, et cetera. Um, so you need to book an appointment. It would often take six to eight months just to get your court date because the system was overloaded. You know, you had justices driving from urban centers out to rural centers for one day a week, loading their personal car with boxes of files, mm. booking, you know, hotel banquet rooms to sort of set up court for the day. This is a system that was not doing certainly not anyone well. well. You know, yeah. the, the government was spending huge amounts of money on it. So they challenge us, can you digitize this process? So this is where it gets interesting because, you know, the actual technology of a payment form is, is not particularly novel, you know, like the idea that you can pay for something online and yeah. that maybe you can even manage a customer service problem online. None of these things were novel. What's novel is we're doing it in the context of we're changing the culture of the justice department, you know, saying, what if a judge didn't have to look at this person? What if a judge was a prosecutor sitting in an office, in a cubicle, in a downtown office building, receiving, you know, digital um, um, disputes yeah. and, and, and reviewing them and getting evidence, maybe photographic evidence or, 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 or a written statements of testimony digitally, and then making a judgment there through clicking a button? What if that's how justice worked? Let me tell you, that was a, that's a hard journey yeah. to ask people to walk on it because we're talking about hundreds of years of precedent in culture. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we did that through, you know, good old fashioned like ride alongs with, with, with police and looking how the thing happened and sitting through court sessions, learning about the process and getting deep into the culture of, you know, why things work the way they did and understanding with, from within their world, you know, developing empathy for how they work and then started to model different ways of doing things. And, 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 and that, that process really helped them to come along for the journey. And by the time we had sort of designed and built the early prototypes, we were validating them. Everyone on that side said, you know, this is actually, this is actually a much better world. We're gonna we're gonna save hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, a year just not running all of the you know these extra court systems. You know, they were they they were you know like I said, booking hotel rooms and driving all over, and then people were waiting, and it was taking six to eight months for this to happen. So you know, once this system rolls out, everything's gonna change. And then you also have privacy issues and security issues. So it's it's complex work. So you know that that's why it takes eighteen months to build a, a fairly simple web form uh, and get it launched, but you know, the benefit at the end of the day is you have drastically changed the entire culture of a justice department. Um, well, I should say we have changed, you know, the, the evidence and, and, and the work changed it. Um, but, you know, ultimately, you, you made a real difference in society and probably saved, you know, I, I don't know that I could say hundreds of millions, but certainly tens of millions of dollars yeah. a year in ongoing costs. 
That's great. That's great. I mean, I practiced law for a number of years and yeah. I remember, you know, getting in the car, driving down, you're billing the, the client the entire time, driving yeah. down to, to sit in a courtroom, sit there for an hour for your matter to be called. You stand up in front of the judge for 30 seconds to set another date in the future, yeah. get yep. back in the car, drive back to the office, you know, a couple hours of blown costs a ton of money, very yep. inefficient. And, you know, in so many ways, I think that if there's a silver lining to this pandemic, it's that it's it's accelerated that type of digital adoption that's going to yeah. save a lot of time. Um, before we run out of time here, I do want to ask about you started your agency in the mid 90s, back when yeah. there were very few people doing that. So, you know, and naturally, I mean, you had you had a natural you know background to start a digital agency. That is you you got a, a B.A. in critical theory. Uh, I'm joking, of course, like, you know, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was an English there, major. So how did, you know, how did that come about? Like, were you just kind of like, you liked tinkering around with websites and you end up starting a, a web company? How did, how did it come about? Well, you, you made the observation when we jumped on the call because you, you and I can see each other and, and everyone else is just listening. So you don't know that I was only four years old when I started my digital agency. <laughs> but um, at, at the time, I was a four-year-old uh, professional musician. <laughs> so I had this dream that I was going to be, I was going to be a musician. I was much older than four, of course. But, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I was, I was touring, I was working. And, and as a musician, it was the early days of the web. I had learned to market and to promote myself. I, you know, I built my first website in 1992 and it was actually not even a proper website on the web it was just sort of an internet site where i could post some information you know via mm. telnet on on my on the local university um, on server so mm. um you know i would just been working as a hobbyist i'd learned to do the work and and at one point um i ended up meeting with uh, a, a, my friend randy thompson who's, who's now a venture capitalist here in canada and he was starting a new business um and he had just through weird luck, ended up in the same room as, and in the mid nineties, Peter Gabriel, his record label, he had a multimedia division and, and mm. they, they made CD ROMs. And he had ended up in a room with the, the folks who were the creative team behind Peter Gabriel's division, some of the business and creative folks. They had just lost their distributor in North America. Um, they were at a uh, film and television gala that Randy had, had gone to. Uh, he said, well, that's funny because I'm a CD-ROM distributor. Do you want to give me a try on consignment? And they said, absolutely. And then he called me the next day and said, quick, we have to figure out how to be a multimedia distributor. <laughs> um, so he knew that I knew how to build websites. He said, we need to do e-commerce. We need to build these things. And, and, and we really quickly spun up in, in, in like mid-90s there, you know, this online commerce, which was almost unheard of. We were marketing CD-ROMs. We were doing streaming audio. We were working with wow. real real networks at the time like the real audio people they were talking That's about us bringing early. in real world catalog and and we were doing streaming services we were like just like pre-bubble you know like we yeah. were doing all the interesting things at that time and then i can recall there was a day where real world had this fantastic new product that came out that was sort of an art book kind of concept called griffin and sabine um, people might remember uh, there was an art book series and they sort of digitized it and gamified it and it was this really cool multimedia kind of art and 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 uh, and, and uh an interactive experience and we had like the oprah show lined up and i had this call with barnes and noble and they were going to stock it north america wide we we're like we're finally going to make some money doing this we're finally going to make some money after all this hustle and on a friday i talked to the barnes and noble person he said great call me monday we'll work out the deals and on monday i called her and she said you know barnes and noble is getting out of the cd rom business yeah. as of this week uh, sorry we can't close the deal it's the internet thing has taken over CD-ROMs. And I called Randy, I said, I think our business just ended. By the way, I make websites now. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll see you later. And I called my brother at that point. And then we started working together. And, and that's that was really the, the birth of Yellow Pencil. It was sort of all in that like nine to 12 month period where we dove in, we had to solve all these challenging problems. And from there, I got into like streaming media and, and commerce and then just building websites. And and that was really how the whole business started in the mid '90s. So it was, it was, it was luck, and like they say, you know, it's it's being ready when lightning strikes. Yeah, um, yeah. Is, is most of success in business. Such a different world back then than it is now. Yeah. Just the generations and generations of evolving technology that have changed. Uh, Paul, this has been great. Uh, where can people go learn more about you? Where? Can, oh, you know what? I missed. I missed. I forgot my gratitude question. Let me ask you that. So, oh yeah. 
uh, my last question I always ask, which is, um, you know, a big fan of gratitude, big fan of expressing yeah. gratitude, especially publicly to uh, people that have been important to you in business over the years and continue to to this day. So, you know, we, we always thank our family and friends. That's great. I love that. But, you know, who's, a, you know, a peer or a contemporary in your industry, however you want to define that, who you mm-hmm. respect and admire the work that they do? I, you know, so my gratitude is going to, there's, I'm going to give you two answers. One is you, you mentioned Carl Smith and you actually called him Carl Schitz at one point, which is now going to be that? my name for him. And you stumbled on it and then corrected yourself. It was a perfect moment. <laughs> Please don't edit it out or this moment in the podcast is going to sound ridiculous. But anyway, Carl Smith is a wonderful, caring, community oriented leader in our digital industries. And he leads this group called the Bureau of Digital. And the Bureau of Digital community has been everything for me in business, meeting other peers, learning how they think, um, uh, just through osmosis, picking up lessons. And so uh, Carl is just as a leader in our, our entire industry, been, been such a such a, a, a boon to me and, and, and to, I know many others. So Carl is definitely somebody that I am grateful for. Um, and then I, I'm going to say another one, which is maybe different, but but right now we do a lot of work in, in your know, large complex content management systems. We built our own platforms. We work with Google Cloud and, and we've created some really cool technology on top of Google Cloud. But in the last few years, we started working with a really interesting company called Box. And you might know them as they, they're sort of like an enterprise Dropbox. They do content cloud, they do file sharing, they do records management. But they, as a company, are so customer focused so rational, so partnership oriented. It is just, I am grateful for finding a company that, you know, like me is really trying to make a difference. Um, and, and it's just so rare that, especially in enterprise software, you meet people that are genuinely trying to do some good in the world and, and doing it, you know, technology first, making great products, doing the right thing around security and features and, and, and communicating transparently and, and working alongside companies like mine, you know, just really saying, how can we be successful together? How can we help each other out? You know, how are we going to grow business together, find customer success together and genuinely meaning it? You know, those kinds of conversations don't happen often. So I, was, I had a meeting with some of their senior leaders this morning and I was just feeling grateful. You, you caught me on a day where I'm feeling grateful for box.com and, yeah. and just a company that I genuinely enjoy working with. And it's just so rare to see a company that can grow to their size, you know, sort of be in the, the, the Silicon Valley world, can, can be in the enterprise software sales world. And like in government, you know, some people get jaded, but, you know, I really, really haven't found those people at Box. So that's great. a company with great culture, you know, I, any, any company with that kind of culture, I, I, I absolutely admire and, and learn from every day. Yeah. Paul, this has been great. Where can people go to learn more about you and connect with you? Well, I mean, yellowpencil.com will tell you very little about my company because, um, you know, Shoemaker's Children. Um, but if you listen to the 311 podcast, um, that's the podcast I've started where I talk to people who are in government doing the really hard work. You know, they're, they're the heroes of that journey. Um, and so that's a great place to learn what I care about and, and hear me talk more um, yeah. if that's something you would like to do. And, and even though you denigrate your website, you know, Cobbler's Shoes kind of thing, I actually think it's a stunning website. It's really just, it really stands out. Um, that was one thing that I had a great impression from it. So go check it out if for no other reason, just to see, uh, you know, a really interesting dynamic design. But uh, Paul, pleasure talking to you. Thanks so much. John, thanks so much for letting me be a guest. It was great to meet you and learn a little bit more about your journey too. Thanks. Likewise. Thank you for listening to the Smart Business Revolution podcast with John Corcoran. Find out more at smartbusinessrevolution.com. And while you're there, sign up for our email list and join the revolution. 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 And be listening for the next episode of the Smart Business Revolution podcast.